Outward is a game that is easy to misunderstand, because at first glance its appeals don't sound very appealing. What's fun about Outward is walking across long distances slowly. It's about being wounded, hungry, cold, diseased. It's about being lost with no map markers or player cursors, and having to use the existing in-game landmarks to orient yourself to your destination. It's about being greatly inconvenienced and slowly discovering ways to be less and less inconvenienced. It is a measured experience, it is slow by design. And a lot of people are gonna not like that. So while I definitely recommend it, I also recommend looking at this video because I'm going to describe the game and its vibes as clearly as I can, and hopefully you'll be able to tell if this is something you're going to like from what you hear. Outward begins with you waking up after a shipwreck. You've made it back home, but all of your cargo is at the bottom of the sea. When you go outside, you're met with an angry crowd of people. The crowd demands from you all the money that you owe. In this tribe, punishments are doled out to the entire family's bloodline. Your grandmother harmed the tribe before you were born. As a result, you today need to make payments to make up for her crimes until your debt is paid. Having been gone at sea, you haven't been able to make those payments, and with the shipwreck, you don't have any money to do so. You are given five in-game days to scrounge together the money for your payment, and if you can't, the tribe will confiscate your home. You may ask how exactly you're supposed to go about getting that money, and to that the game says, go figure it out. This will be a reoccurring theme in this game. Before you can head out into the wilderness, you're guided into getting a water skin and a backpack. More on that soon. You head outside, following the call to adventure. And at this point, you'll probably encounter your first pair of bandits, which means it's time to talk about combat. In Outward, combat is about proper spacing, it's about observing the enemy's telegraphed attacks and blocking or dodging. You find openings between their attacks and take advantage of those opportunities. If this sounds similar to Dark Souls, it is, but it also has some key differences. First of all, enemies have a poise meter that you can see beneath their health. When this poise meter is full, all enemy attacks have hyper armor. Hyper armor means that they won't be staggered when they get hit. They'll poise through your attacks and land a hit on you if you decide to trade. Hitting an enemy with an attack, aside from just doing damage, will also lower their stability bar. That bar will recover over time, but if you can keep up the pressure and the bar goes below 50%, the enemy will be staggered by every hit from then on. If you keep attacking and the bar reaches zero, the enemy will be knocked down. While they're knocked down and getting back up, they won't be able to do anything else giving you an opportunity for free damage. But their stability bar also goes back to 100%, and it can't take any stability damage for the duration that it was on the ground. So the flow of combat is find or create enough openings to get the enemy's stability bar to 50%. When at 50, press your advantage while the enemy gets staggered with every hit to do as much damage as possible. And if the enemy isn't dead by the time he gets back up, you play cautiously again as you try and find or create more openings. The hyper armor on enemies can feel clunky at first, but the system is surprisingly robust once you understand and can take advantage of the combat's flow. There's also a variety of different skills and magic. Most of these will go on a cooldown after being used, and there'll be an essential way of creating openings. We'll talk more about these later, as at first you don't have access to many of them. Anyway, if you beat the bandits, you're going to come to a lot of different realizations immediately. Number one, the backpack mechanic. In Outward, you have a very limited inventory. You can only carry 10 units of weight on your person. And that's not very much. A weapon could be 7 pounds worth of weight. A backpack lets you carry a great deal more at the cost of not being able to roll properly if you're wearing one. And if you get hit while you're wearing it, items that are in your backpack that have durability, like food items, will lose that durability as you get hit. Luckily, you don't have to be wearing the backpack all the time. You can drop it and pick it up at the push of a button without having to go through any menus. I've never actually seen a game use a system like this, but I think it's great. It's very immersive and it's practical. You have a small pocket inventory, and in there you keep things like potions, bandages, antidotes. Things that you still want to have access to even though you've dropped your backpack for the added mobility. And then the pack has a much larger inventory space where you put your loot and where you keep the essentials that you're going to need while traveling. Speaking of which, let's go back to the post-bandit encounter. You get done looting their bodies and then you notice, oh my goodness, I took a lot of damage in that battle. 
With it being so early in the game and you not having found any armor or any better equipment, you realize that attacks from even the most minor of enemies will do a lot of damage to you. And so now we need to heal. Which raises the question, how do we heal? Well, we'll need to eat food. But we just started the game. We were too thoughtless. We didn't bring any food. But that's all right. You see an animal in the distance. You think you can take it. You kill it and take the meat. But now you need to cook it. Which means you'll have to gather wood and craft it into a campfire. You place the campfire on the ground. And now you need to light the fire. You'll need a flint and steel for that. Assuming you have one, you can light the fire and cook the food. You can cook the meat directly on the campfire. But if you decided to bring a cooking pot along, you can cook more efficiently and it gives you access to all the various recipes that you've learned. The game will start you off with some basic recipes. And you can learn more by reading a recipe scroll. These can be found as loot in the world, and you can buy different ones from different merchants in different towns. And of course, if you already happen to know the recipe off the top of your head, you don't actually need to have the recipe to cook the food. Now, having eaten the food, your character will start to heal. Slowly. He will heal very slowly. Different foods heal at different rates, but they all grant a passive 10-minute health regeneration. If you needed more healing than it's giving you, then you can use bandages and the health regen from the bandages and the food will stack together. But even combined, this passive health regeneration is very slow in comparison to what other games might have you used to. Of course, there are also health potions that you can bring, and their healing works normally. It's large, and it happens immediately. You are unlikely to have any at this point of the game, but like most things, you can craft them if you find their ingredients in the wild, and have the recipe or knowledge on how to make them, assuming, of course, you decided to bring an alchemy set along with you in this journey. Anyway, however you managed it, you tend to your wounds, and continue your journey in search of money. The game can be harsh, but it's not completely without guidance. If you take your time and look carefully around the town, you will be given advice and locations and quests to help you orient around specific goals, so you don't get overwhelmed by all the systems in front of you. So right now, we're heading towards a dungeon that the game guided us to. Now the trouble is, Outward has no map markers. When an NPC tells you to go somewhere, and gives you directions on how to get there, you should probably pay attention. Out in the world, you will have a map, but there are no quest markers on that map, and your player doesn't have a magical GPS showing you where you are. So if you want to know where you are, you'll have to figure it out using in-game landmarks. Anyway, following directions, you've managed to get to the dungeon I was talking about. And here you realize, it's dark. It's pretty dark. Outward is a game that embraces true darkness. Cave systems, the inside of buildings, and even outside at night can get so dark it really is very difficult to see. As you might expect, the inside of a dungeon has many more enemies than the overworld does, and at a higher density. Which means there will be a lot less time for your passive healing to heal you between encounters. Assuming you clear any dungeon, you'll be able to loot it. And there's always more loot than you could possibly carry in your backpack. At this point, Outward becomes a resource management game. You'll have to decide what's worth keeping for yourself, what to bring back to sell, and what to leave behind. As you play, you'll develop a sense for the practical utility and monetary value of different items. And you'll need that sense because silver, the in-game currency, is a primary method of getting stronger. You see, Outward has no levels. There's no experience points. You don't get stronger by defeating enemies. You get stronger by accumulating silver and then using that silver to pay the different trainers in different towns for new active and passive skills. The starting town will have one trainer, and every other town will have two. It is through these trainers that you can start to develop your build. If you want to be a mage, a rogue, a warrior, or a mix in between, you'll do that by going to these trainers and choosing the skills that align with what you're trying to do. Now, Outward has an interesting system for choosing your class. When you go to a trainer, they'll have skills that are below a breakthrough point and skills that are above. The skills below are cheaper and any kind of build can buy them without consequence. However, if you wanted to access the breakthrough skill or the skills above it, not only are those like 10 times as expensive, but they'll also require that you spend a breakthrough point, permanently committing you to that class. You only get three of these breakthrough points, but in the game there are 11 trainers. Furthermore, each trainer has mutually exclusive skills above the breakthrough point, 
meaning they have skills that you can only buy one or the other of. This creates an enormous amount of build diversity, since there are 11 trainers and each trainer has at least two ways you can specialize into. With so many builds and sub-builds, the game has a great deal of replay value. Even if you're playing with a friend and both you and your friend choose the same skill breakthroughs, you can end up playing in surprisingly different ways. Now, let's say you get back to town and pay off your debt for your house, or you fail to pay off your debt and lose the house. Either way, the story continues. At this point, you're guided into joining one of several factions and going through the story from that faction's perspective. Each one of these factions is located in a different town in a different region, none of which is the region you're currently in. These regions are large. They have different biomes, and traversing them takes a significant amount of time. And there's no fast travel, or mounts. Getting from one place to the other will require you to walk. Which brings me to my next point. Outward is about discovering something inconvenient and figuring out how to deal with it. For example, let's talk about health and stamina burn. Whenever you take damage in Outward, or when you use up stamina to attack or to run, some small amount of that health or that stamina will get burned, which means it won't recover all the way back up. The longer that you're out in the wilderness fighting, exploring, or clearing dungeons, the harder it'll get, because the total amount of health and stamina you have access to is just going to get lower and lower. This system also discourages you from running all the time. Running consumes your stamina, so if you run everywhere, that's the fastest way to burn it. Also, the stamina recovery in this game is significantly slower than it is in other games. You can mitigate that by eating food that increases your stamina recovery, but even with that, it's not exactly fast. So if you're running everywhere, not only does it burn your stamina reducing the total amount of stamina, which will leave you unprepared for dealing with a dungeon if that's where you're running to, but that also means that if you happen upon an enemy and you can't avoid it, you'll have used up a lot of your stamina already and you might not have enough left to deal with this encounter. So the game incentivizes you not to do that. You're not supposed to run everywhere. You're supposed to walk. Slowly. Now the Burnt's health and stamina aren't permanent. In order to heal those afflictions, your character will need to sleep. You can do that in a town, at an inn, or at your house, but if you're out in the wild and you need to do it there, that's also an option. For that purpose, you'll need to bring a bedroll or a tent, while you're camped out, you can devote hours to sleep, which will heal your burnt stamina and health. You can also devote hours to repairing your equipment, as it'll likely have been damaged somewhat in the journey. Finally, you can also devote time to lower your ambush chance. While out in the wilderness or in a dungeon, there'll be a percentage chance of an enemy discovering your camp and ambushing you. You'll have to devote time to keeping watch to prevent that from happening. If you're playing co-op, and one friend is more in need of repairing and sleeping than the other, then one of them can devote most of his time to guarding the camp, while the other one predominantly rests. You sleep to mitigate the costs of exploring for long periods of time. But sleeping also has a cost, because the hours that you spent sleeping and repairing and guarding for ambush are hours that your character didn't eat or drink, and the time that passes is time that the food in your inventory gets closer to spoiling. Your character has needs and can be afflicted with various maladies, most of which can be pretty severe. If your character is hungry, his health will burn three times faster. If he's thirsty, the stamina will burn three times faster. The seasons can change in some places, bringing a extreme difference to the temperature in the environment. If you're not prepared to deal with these temperatures, exploring can become difficult or even impossible. Your character can also contract various diseases such as colds or infections. If your character dies, a variety of different death scenarios can occur. You might get rescued by somebody and brought somewhere else. You might be brought all the way back to town. You might crawl yourself to the entrance. Either way, most of the time, your health and stamina will take an extreme amount of burn. And in nearly all situations, it's very inconvenient. If you are going through a dungeon and the death scenario happens to put you all the way back to town, that could be a huge amount of time that you need to spend getting back to the dungeon. With the potential cost for dying being so high, every sticky situation you get into can be very tense. The fundamental appeal of Outward is that it's weird and it's hard and it's inconvenient, and there are many steps to doing simple things. For example, magic. In fact, the best example is magic. How do you cast a fireball in Outward? 
At the beginning of the game, you have no magic, and no ability to cast any magic. If you ask the alchemist in town, she will tell you that to unlock magic, you must go and visit the ley line in the center of the mountain in the region. So you walk to the foot of the mountain. To get to the center, you must traverse one of three dungeons of your choosing. Assuming you're doing this at the beginning of the game, all of those dungeons are probably harder than anything you've done so far. Assuming you made it through the dungeon, and are in front of the ley line, now you need to decide how much health and stamina you're going to give up in order to unlock magic. The more health and stamina you give up, the bigger your mana pool will be. But the sacrifice is permanent. And like I said before, this game has no levels. So there are a very limited number of ways for you to get more health and stamina. Once you make that sacrifice though, regardless of how much you got, you'll be given access to your first spell, and theoretically, you'll be able to use fire magic. You'll be able to cast a fireball. In order to do that, first you'll need to cast Fire Sigil. This will create a sigil of fire on the ground that will last for 60 seconds. If you are standing inside that sigil, you can cast the spell you got at the ley line, and that will finally let you cast a fireball. But it's not that simple, because every time you cast Fire Sigil, it consumes a fire stone. You can occasionally find and buy fire stones, but if you want a steady supply, you're going to have to have your alchemical set out with you and craft fire stones. In order to craft fire stones, you're probably going to need a lot of mana stones to turn into fire stones. Again, you can buy these, but they can be expensive, and if you wanted to have a healthy supply of them, you'll want to collect all the ones you can find in the wild, which means mining any of the mana stone deposits that you see around. In order to mine these mana stone deposits, you must have a pickaxe in your inventory. As you can see, magic is a complicated process. Casting a fireball does not happen at the press of a button. There's a great deal of preparation you must do beforehand. And the fire magic isn't the only kind of magic in the game. They're all weird and convoluted in their own way. Just as a brief example, there's also rune magic. In order to do rune magic, you must have a lexicon equipped on your offhand. And you'll need to know the four available runes. Casting each rune will cost mana, and by themselves they don't do anything. But by casting different runes in the correct order, a variety of different spells can be used. All of the magic in the game is powerful, but it also all requires preparation, and it has significant costs. Outward is one of the few games where using magic actually made me feel like a mage. You know that thing people say when you criticize something as unrealistic, or immersion-breaking? And they'll rebut with something like, oh, you want realism in a game that has you know, dragons and casting fireballs out of your hand. Yes, yes, I want realism. I want the air of realism in a fantasy game that has fireballs. Not only that, I would like that realism introduced into the actual casting of the fireballs, like this. Something like immersion isn't just a yes or no thing. It's not like there are games that are immersive, and then there are games that aren't immersive. No, immersion exists on a slider. It exists on a scale and there are elements you can introduce into your game that increase or decrease immersion. There are things that you can do to ground it in reality. And that means it's possible to have realistic magic systems, even if magic isn't real. And that attitude is one the game adopts not just for the magic system, but for the whole game. It's annoying, it's hard, it's inconvenient. The first time I played I died near a bandit encampment, and the death scenario had me dragged back into their camp. When I woke up, most of my health and stamina were gone, and several days had passed. Still unaccustomed to the game, I tried to find my backpack, and was killed repeatedly in that encampment. This happened so many times that by the time I actually got my backpack and left the camp, it had started snowing. It was so cold outside my character got sick, his health was continuously depleted, I didn't have the equipment to resist the cold or the knowledge of how to endure it. The freezing temperatures killed me, and I was dragged back to the starting town by the death scenario. In there I was safe and I could tend to my wounds and my diseases, but I still couldn't get out of the town. The cold was brutal, and my character couldn't go 10 paces outside of the front gate without getting sick again, and he couldn't go 20 before beginning to die of frostbite. It was terribly irritating, but it was this irritating situation that got me into the game. I was being forced to prepare and pay attention in a way that a lot of games just don't do. And the process of figuring things out, figuring out how to survive in the cold, how to make your magic work, 
how to navigate to your destination without map markers or player cursors, how to not slam your controller against the wall when the death scenario puts you back to town 20 minutes away from the dungeon you were currently clearing, was awfully fun, at least eventually. And that's the end of this video. As always, thank you very much for watching. The, the audience that Nine Dots want to cater to, our profile I call the sophisticated gamer. And not in the snob sense, but in the sense of gamers who have a lot of experience, they know what they want, they have very specific tastes, and uh, more and more games need to attract a large audience because of their, uh, their expanded budget. And that means they kind of have to, like, old players are kind of left over, or they're just not catered to for foremost. They start with aiming at younger players. Why? Because there are just more of them who are actively buying and playing games. Like, the, the most uh, lucrative demographic in games has always been uh, teenagers, when we're talking like teenager boys, more precisely. So they're okay. aiming at 16 Fortnite. to 20 years old guys, uh, and sometimes even younger. They're the the core public you want to target to if you want to have the highest amount of sales. But in the process, um, players that are like 30 years old, like me, well, I'm 33. Yeah, we I'm, are I'm left with, with you, not, we're, we're, we are not having that wide of a selection of games that are directly targeting us as a public. Right. And so I identified that problem and I want Nine Dots to be like for us, for players like us who've been playing forever and we know our shit and we want to be challenged. We want our expertise in games to be um, challenged.